every time. That song is so good. Hello. I know. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us once again for another episode of Let's Scream. Heck yes, episode five, right? Yes, I had I had to count them. Actually, who have we had on the show so far? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a good sign, you know. It means that you know things are moving along nicely when you when we lose track of things. So this is good. Exactly. Plus, it's good to keep track because we're going to have so many more shows. So it's going to be amazing. Exactly. So how are you doing, Allie? How was good? Your- Not feeling this weather, but otherwise, like hanging in there with everything going on. How are you today? I'm good. Very good. Same. Similar. I'm, I'm definitely feeling the daylight saving time. <laughs> you know? I forgot that was a thing until I woke up and was like, why are all the clocks weird? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just, it's been a week. Like, I feel like I'm, like, this weird jet lag, but not really jet lag, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> Trying my, mostly I'm I'm hungry at the weirdest hours. I was like, why? Yeah, I feel like I'm hungry, like, an hour before I was supposed to eat, and I'm like, this feels weird now. <laughs> I know, exactly. So, have you watched anything good recently? Oh, my God, I'm, like, embarrassed to say, but I am on the sixth season of Pretty Little Liars. <laughs> Oh my god, already? <laughs> no, like, I, don't, I, I had I had only watched the first season when it first came out, and I was like, it's all on Netflix, I should revisit this show. It has a lot of homages to horror. It's like a murder mystery, yeah. and I love teen angsty shows. And, exactly. Oof. Like, it is the gossip girl of murder, and oh, yeah. I am... Like, six seasons in, I'm like, okay, everyone's A, everyone's cool with adults just banging their teenagers, and uh, everyone's a computer hacker before they're 20, so. Oh, yeah. This is the world we're living in, in Rosewood. Very true. I'm really really digging all the giallo homages, though, like, you know, I mean, we've already established I'm way too much of a giallo freak, but I'm really kind of enjoying it. homages, and I'm just like, all right, cool, all right, I'm here for this. If it, honestly, I look at it as, like, the gateway drug into horror. Like, all the little 13-year-olds yeah. who are like, oh, this is so scary, but, like, what is this referencing? And then maybe they look it up, and then maybe they get super into horror. So I'm here for it. Yeah, exactly. you keep watching. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing I go into, I got to say about Pretty Little Liar, uh, and then I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> the one thing, though, I got to say is that this show made me feel old for the first time. Because <laughs> when I was watching it, I just, I had so, so often this moment, like, why don't they just tell their parents? <laughs> like, you know, I'd be like, I also just, I'd like, like, call the police or tell their parents. And also the amount exactly. of phones on the show, I was like, oh, right. This, this was started in 2007. Yeah, exactly. No, that's it. There's just so much of it where I was like, okay, yeah, I'm obviously thinking like a grown up right now. Like I, I forgot the teen angst and like not wanting to get adults involved. But yeah. Oh my God, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I mean, recently, I think I, we talked about it a bit um, online outside of the show but um my latest film that i watched i really thought was fresh you know oh, which... fresh is so good like i yeah. am here for that movie yeah it was it was a dinner time movie for me and i kind of regretted my choice halfway halfway through i i, I sort of had um well i knew what it was about because i mean the Without giving it away, the description, like, if you know horror, like, you know, you read the description, I'm like, yeah, I know, I know what, what it's going to be about, obviously. Yes, yeah, something normal then, happens and bad stuff happens. <laughs> exactly. But the way it was presented, I had low moments. I'm all like, okay, I'm going to put my fork down right now. <laughs> Just, like, maybe in a way, you know. I loved it. Like, written yeah. by a lady, directed by a lady. I like, know. Sebastian Stan was crazy throughout oh, it all. I didn't know that cotton candy grapes were a thing and I found them at the store by my house and I was like there's no way these taste like cotton candy. <laughs> sure enough they do and now I cannot stop giving them to people. Yeah oh it's so good. Yeah see I've been looking for them everywhere in Montreal. Like I know they exist. Like I, I know I've had them in the past. It's just like now every time I step into like a, a fruit market place I'm like do they do you have cotton candy grape and people look at me like what why? What are those? Yeah I had to go to the like the expensive grocery store to get them, but I was like, this yeah. was worth it. This was worth the like five dollars I paid for these grapes. Yeah. Cool. So um I guess I mean um I'm enjoying talking with you. I know but we have a really um you know exciting guest you know tonight that I cannot wait and I'd like her to hop on and uh, join our discussions. So I don't know if you want to do the honors of uh, saying who we're gonna be talking to tonight. Yes 
This is the co-host of the Fatty of Horror podcast, the co-founder of the Black Museum, and the editor of Room Org magazine. We have Andrea Subasati here. Hello, and Dante. Dante. Hello. Oopsie. Oh, okay. I grabbed him now. I don't know how long he'll oh my last in my hands. He's got a grumbly tummy, and I'm actually worried that the mic will pick it up. <laughs> it's like oh, farting. Right? It's audible. It well, sounds like a balloon leak. It's like. <laughs> Well, I cannot hear it. If ever people hear it, they'd be like, it's the, it's a doggo. So it's a dog. And they'll be fine with it. They'll be like, oh, so yeah. cute. Yeah. It's so adorable. It's like the, guys. it's the rumor. Hello, how are you doing tonight? Yes. I am doing pretty good. Pretty good. I'm in uh, I'm in production for the May June issue, so it's kind of crunch time and uh, we're recording Faculty of Horror on Friday. But when is it not crunch time, right? For creatives. If I have 10 minutes to spare, I will find something urgent to do with them. So uh, yep. busy, busy as always, but uh, good. Good to be here. Nice. Can you give us any sneak done. peeks as to what the next issue might have in it? Well, um, I've noticed a wee bit of a trend happening with um, psychic children in horror. So maybe the new issue will explore that subject. Uh, I heard through the grapevine that the big ass Edgar Allan Poe Museum in Virginia has just turned 40 and mm -hmm. has a whole Ooh. bunch of new stuff in it. And so maybe there will be a feature on that. Um, you guys might have heard the um, or heard of the trailer dr for dropping for uh, Amityville in space. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, the WTF heard across the internet. We might be seeking to answer those three letters in the new issues. So yeah, there's a piece. We like to have those questions answered. Why yeah. Star Wars Yeah. Why another one? Like, I feel like we have 40 Amityville films at this point. At least. Yeah. I think it's the biggest franchise. Yeah. Yeah. I think I counted the time. I sat down and counted. But that was before the new TCM came out. So you got to okay. count again every year. I was always under the impression that Friday the 13th was the longest, or... I I'd be know. wrong. It's close to being the most through line, whereas Amityville is like, they kind of slapped that name. On a oh, place. gotcha. Yeah. Right. Because it's a place, and you can't... Yeah. Exactly. It's like in, like, upstate New York, or wherever it is. Yeah. It's funny, because, like, whenever I see, like, in space, it's like, that's when I realize I'm all like, oh, wow, we're at that stage right now. <laughs> yeah. Were there that many of this movie space. that were already in space? Wow. No, Hellraiser like, in space. It's always it's always a good trope to have when you're like five or six into a franchise. Yeah. Well, fun fact, uh, I don't have it with me, but I'm currently reading this book called um, The Final Girl Support Group. Oh, Grady uh, Hendrix? Uh, like, Grady, uh, Grady Hendrix. Yeah. It's really good. And, yeah, so good. it's like every chapter, it's like there's always like, um, you know, for example, um, the the final girl support, support group that's the first chapter then the second one is like the return and then chapter three is like um was it 3d you know and there's one chapter that's like in space and like you know there's like bride of son of you know this one like so so yeah it was just like so hilarious because like he just with with his chapter titles he just like plays around with all those like movie title trope and like the further we go in the book like the more ridiculous they get like it usually does in uh, in those long-running franchises so okay, i'm excited but, to see that get turned into a tv show because i feel like charlie Theron got involved and they're making it into a whole thing and that's so cool yeah i think it's gonna be really good i think out of all of his books that's gonna be a really fun one to make yeah. into a movie slash tv show because i'm not 100 percent sure i know which one it's going to be yeah. I've heard of uh, my best friend's exorcism also being currently worked on. I, I but I don't know if that's a movie or if it's going to be a TV show for by with Amazon if I'm not mistaken. So either way, I'm down for both. Totally. So, right off the bat, congrats uh, to Rue Morg and to you on all of your Rondo nominations. Yeah, thank you. Heck yes, you guys have so many. You have uh, best magazine, you have best article that you wrote, uh, best interview, best column, best cover, best podcast. Like, Rumor is cleaning up this year. Oh, uh, well, we'll see. It's an honor to be nominated. Of course, it's Fatty of Horror's first ever nomination. So we were pretty excited about that. Really? That's I amazing. could have sworn you guys got nominated before, but it's crazy that it took this long. Yeah. These things happen. We're about to turn 10. Can you believe that? Oh my gosh. 
that was one of the questions was, wow, you guys have been doing faculty of horror for 10 years. Like, give us the lowdown. How did that start? How did you and Alex West get yeah. together and decide that this was the platform? Well, um, you know, Alex really steered that ship. It was really her idea. We had both been guests on the Rue Morgue podcast. And um, I think the first time you're a guest on a podcast and you're terrified and you're super nervous and then you get in there and it's just dude sitting at a computer and you walk <laughs> out and you're like, oh, okay, that was a thing. And then you hear it all prettied up and cleaned up and edited with music added. And you're like, holy fuck, that was awesome. And that was so easy anyone could do this. So I think, I think we were both inspired by that. And of course it was early enough in the game that not everybody and their mom had a podcast. Mm -hmm. And so we felt like, uh, like we could have a presence. There weren't a whole lot of horror podcasts. There certainly weren't a lot of lady led horror podcasts. And so, uh, mm -hmm. it was Alex's idea and, uh, I did some research and I plugged a, a, a USB rock band mic into my laptop and we recorded with that for I think like the first two years that we did it. Oh so I, I'm like team rock band Mike, you know, I, 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 I was using this, you know, for all my Skype calls and everything because it was so much better or like any kind of podcast interview that I had. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to use this. It's so much cleaner than the, the computer microphone. Yeah. It works. Hey, yeah. if it works, it works. Yeah. That is incredible. And, um, did the pandemic affect it at all? Were you guys like, yes, let's go hard. We have nothing but time. We can't go anywhere. Um, I think we did. We recorded the podcast remotely, like not mm -hmm. sitting together for the first time ever. And that was kind of, you know, that was kind of hard on the heart and soul to not cheers and get wasted like we usually do. Um, but I think we only did that once and then we decided that now we're going to have to bubble together and not see anyone else and, and make this work. So I think when the pandemic hit, we were just mostly concerned with offering something to our listeners because everybody was hurting, everybody was suffering. And, you know, we launched our Patreon, I think about five years ago, maybe four, but it hasn't been that, that long. And so, yeah, we've definitely devoted a lot of extra effort toward extra bonus content. Uh, so everyone can feel some warm and fuzzies in this terrible time. Cool. I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm curious about the choice of like this angle because because uh, as like, you know, I guess I'm going to be a nerd for a second, but um, I did, you know, my master's, um, I, I finished in like 2011. Uh, yeah, 2011. And I mean, as far as I'm concerned, at Concordia, I was the only person working on horror and it was still like very frowned upon when I when I was doing it. And I was really, um, I really felt like, like I was struggling, like in terms of um, academically, for like horror to be taken seriously and like you know it just made everything so much harder and then at the same time so much more exciting and then over the years like you know there's been like you know your podcast and then there's been like other women who've worked more on the topic of like you know women in horror and then uh women directors and and um and other women like positive um you know connotation between like women and horror um so so this this is really exciting but it feels like your podcast was very much like at the beginning of that that whole wave so i'm i'm curious to uh to know more about what got you like you know what influenced that choice of topic or if there's like you know how that played in uh deciding to uh to take more of an academic i guess angle uh to what you do well, I think, uh, can I ask you, Mode? what was your master's in? Uh, mine was in media studies okay. um, at Concordia. So yeah. it was an hybrid program so that had some production. So um, uh, I did a documentary web series. It was supposed to be a documentary, but I decided to release it on the web because uh, the topic was evolving so much to keep up and like it just was automatically dated every month, you know? So I figured I'm just going to put it as a snapshot. So um, it was about, yeah, women horror filmmakers um, and coincidentally the beginning of the Women in Horror Month because uh, as I was working, it started. So uh, so that was exciting for, yeah. for, uh, for the thesis itself because I, I had something interesting to talk about. But uh, it was mostly, I guess, from um, like an autoethnographic studies of it, like, you know, just looking at women horror fans, um, you know, as that itself has been um, a bit of a, of a subversive, um, you know, um, reaction to the genre that, that mm -hmm. like, you know, has some very 
um, heteronormative and very um, binary, like gender role encoded into it. And what mm -hmm. it like, you know, is the privilege, I guess, um, um, actions of watching. Like, you know, for example, like the, the women seeking reassurance of the, their male dates and everything, you know, so looking at female, yeah, I know, <laughs> looking at female fans and how just liking horror itself is, is an act of resistance towards that. And then when you push this further, the women who decide to make movies and like how that just itself becomes something um, even more uh, to, to have a bit more agency and what the work that they do look like, you know, so, but obviously very much a snapshot of where things were at in 2010, 2011, yeah, but yeah. Which is rad. Uh, I, I find that interesting. And I had a feeling you weren't going to say film studies because I came from a sociology background yeah. and I too had to like, I had to devote the first chapter of my thesis to just like, here's why horror film's important. Here's why horror film is relevant. Here's why horror film. <laughs> yeah. Motherfuckers don't have to do that in film studies. They don't. No. And I envy them for that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I come from sociology and Alex West comes from a uh, theater background. She has a master's in theater. So, um, so we noticed that when we talked about horror movies, we talked in two ways that we didn't hear other people really talk about horror movies uh, in, in, in the big horror journalism media, which is to say our discussions were academic and our discussions were feminist. And I know that we were kind of reticent to use the word feminist out mm -hmm. there. It's like, okay, well, we're women talking and speaking our truths and taking our space, which is de facto feminist, but you know, mm -hmm. um, we're just going to talk about what we love about those movies and that's not in itself feminist is it it is and like we embraced that uh that term i think by the fourth episode but yeah we realized that that's just how we liked to talk about movies but whenever we talked about movies like that to the dude bros they would roll their eyes and resume like steer the conversation toward you know shannon elizabeth's titties or something and it's great i can talk about those for i don't know maybe three minutes but uh yeah. Um, yeah, we were just like, we like talking about this. And so we will like doing the podcast. And even if nobody listens, we'll have had our fun. And that was That's indeed amazing. the case probably for the first like year, you know, you're looking desperately for stats and it's like 15 people, high five. <laughs> yeah. And now you're recording live shows at like the Salem Horror Fest. Like you've been taking the podcast on the road. Do you think that's something you're going to continue going forward now that COVID in Ontario is apparently over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. Um, maybe. I mean, Salem Horror Fest was actually the first place to... No, they weren't. They weren't the first place to invite us to do a live show. But it was the first <laughs> ever Salem Horror Fest, and we really fell in love with the programmer. We fell in love with Kay. We fell in love with Kay's mandate and, you know, just unapologetic, no bullshit, this is what we're about attitude. And so... So yeah, we really believed in the fest. And that's not to say that we like don't believe in other fests, but like there was something special there about really Salem. Special about Salem Horror Fest. Yeah. yeah. I and I had never been to Salem. Alex had gone uh, by herself. And so, yeah, it was really fun to take a field trip. And then that kind of turned into a residency of sorts. Like, you know, we never had the boyfriend, girlfriend talk about being exclusive, but it's like, well, we're not doing any other fests. I don't know if you're doing <laughs> other podcasts. <laughs> nice. But yeah, I wouldn't mind doing some more. I mean, it's it's definitely fun to travel, but I think faculty of like I'm really protective of it, you mm -hmm. know. And when mm -hmm. it's your baby, it's like I, I you know, festivals are sometimes run by shitheads, and sometimes their shit isn't held out to dry for many years. So, um, and sometimes I think that up in Canada, some of that gossip doesn't really reach us. You mm -hmm. know, like I don't know if you felt that way when. Uh, when Me Too was happening and a lot of stuff was being held up to light and, you know, you would see our colleagues talking about, oh, yeah, I knew that person was a creep. Everyone in the industry knows to stay away from that person. And I'd be like, I didn't know that. I'm all the way up here. I only see these motherfuckers at festivals. I don't know who the predators are. Um, so I'm going off on a bit of a tangent. But all this to say that, you know, mm -hmm. we've been really selective who we align our brand with. Um, because if if anything were to go down with someone who came to see us, uh, we would be really heartbroken by that. No, that's a very like real situation. 
And also when you find out that someone's terrible, then you've aligned yourself with them. You're like, oh no, am I going to be on the chopping block next? Am I going to get canceled for just yeah. not knowing and then associating with someone that you didn't know did X, Y, Z? Yeah. yeah, totally. That's the thing. It's like guilty by association, you know, without guilty knowing. Guilty by association, yeah. 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 I know. So you also have a master's thesis on the social impact of zombie cinema, which you published at the title of When There's No More Room in Hell, The Sociology of the Living Dead. Can you tell us more about that? I had a copy here just the other day, and I've lost it, probably because it's so small. Can we talk a bit about regret? I don't yes. regret. Let's talk regret. <laughs> yeah, talk about I all yes. regrets. <laughs> I don't have many, but I regret publishing that book with an academic publisher. And basically, I don't know if this happened to you, Mode, uh, but um, I call you Mode. Is it Mode or Mode? Yeah, yeah, that's that's how. Yeah, no, mm. that's perfect. I love this Mode. Is, uh... um, I don't know about you, but like, have you ever gotten like headhuntered? by those academic publishers who are like, we want to publish your thesis. And you're like, is this legit? More or less. I mean, I mostly, I went to conferences, uh, yeah. you know, to present it. Like, you know, they have these like little booths and stand and like, you know, you see, you look at this stuff and like, oh, you can publish with us. And here's like everything like you can. And like, I really, I considered it for a while, but like, you know, what stopped me, cause I did want to make it accessible. But then what stopped me was like, okay, so I need to write a whole extra chapter to contextualize a lot of the things because so much of it was, as I was saying, like by the time I was done, I think it was and ready that would have been ready to publish was like 2012 or 2013. And a lot of the data I had was from 2009 and 2010, you know? So in that like gap, so much happened, you know? Yeah. So I kind of feel like, oh, I need to write an entire new chapter to contextualize the like you know where the, those information comes from and how it relates to now yeah. and uh, I just got lazy and too busy with it you know with other stuff that I never pulled through but yeah why do you have regret you know uh a, an academic publisher reached out to me and said they wanted to publish my thesis as is and mm -hmm. I thought about it and at the time I had just moved to Toronto and I was working in market research Mm -hmm. So I was doing applied sociology and like, I didn't think that horror was behind me or anything. I knew that I was always going to be doing stuff in horror, but I didn't think, I didn't think I'd be writing uh, extensively mm -hmm. on horror. So I was like, well, this is probably my shot at a publication. Mm -hmm. I do have this body of work. And it was about the zombie renaissance, which was just kind of peaking at the time. Mm -hmm. This was right around the time of, well, the time that I defended my thesis was, you know, Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead mm -hmm. remake. Uh, 28 Days Later was really big. Shaun of the Dead was really big. It was just kind of right at that moment of the mainstreamization of mm -hmm. zombie flicks. And so I thought if anyone in the world is ever going to buy this book, it is because some asshole university curriculum is making them. So I may as well go with an academic publisher, you know, and they'll publish it as is and it'll be easy peasy. But um, But I regret it because it's... $80. Um, yeah. I think it, it was it was like 65 at first and now it's up to 80 somehow. It is ugly as sin. I hate the look of it. It oh. makes me ill. And it is like a teeny little thing. I hate the typeset. I hate the spacing. I kind of hate everything about it. And so uh, if anyone is watching this and you would like to read my book, please don't buy it. Uh, email me and I'll send you a PDF. That's what I've been doing for Faculty of Horror listeners. Like, I'll give it to you for free. It is my master's thesis as is because like mode, I was just too lazy to like not dumb it down, but just give it some context and trim out some of the theory. And like, it could have been a good book, but I didn't have my feet wet in the industry and I didn't have the confidence to make it happen. So mm -hmm. I went with an academic publisher and I regret it. And for a couple of years, I was like, maybe it's not too late. And then I'm like, no, it's way too late. Everyone's written about zombie movies now. Like, that's done. But, yeah. you know, now I write about horror movies. I'm published six times a year, technically, in the magazine. So it wasn't yeah. my only shot. Well, you've also been published in several books. You're part of uh, Yuletide and Scared Sacred and... Muted Yourself. Yeah. Why? I don't, I don't know. know why. Do you have like why? a <laughs> mute hotkey? It's just, I, technology hates me. It's just a thing. Um, 
But yes, you've been published a number of times in a bunch of different like <laughs> horror studies books. Um, can you tell us more about that? Like you're with Yuletide Terror and Scared Sacred and Undead in Theology. Okay. Um, Undead in Theology, I think that was the first one. And, you know, because I had gotten published with an academic publisher and following that were my appearances on the Rue Morgue podcast. Um, John Moorhead actually uh, reached out to me about this book he was putting together. And I had done uh, like a 10 page paper, excuse me, for like a media studies class where I was kind of talking about Cenobites as agents of hell. And I was like, oh, I, I could expand upon that in uh, in a chapter. And so I did. And that was a that was a wonderful experience. It was great. I was like, oh, maybe I could actually like do this sometimes because at the time, um, you know, you're deciding whether or not to go through with your PhD. You're deciding whether or not to give over this big like another third of your life to being fucking poor and fucking mm -hmm. frustrated and stressed. Like, I decided not to do that, but maybe I can still do some academic writing and keep my passions alive. And so. I did that one. I did Scared Sacred. I did Yuletide Terror. And then I kind of got, you know, by then my career was really picking up with Rue Morgue. And I used to find it really challenging to kind of switch hats to go from academic writing to Rue Morgue writing. And indeed, I think that was the kind of thing that uh, that held me back from writing for Rue Morgue back when I first moved to Toronto and I was trying was that, you know, my pitches were too esoteric. They were too, they were too much about what I wanted to write about and not what readers wanted to read per se, you know? And I think that's kind of the curse of the passionate horror academic because I get those pitches all the fucking time. I get them from academics and I'm like, look, I get you. I get that you want to write about The Shining for the thousandth time, but we've run features on the shining since it came out like i can't i can't um yeah so anyway i started kind of the more i was writing for the magazine the more i felt unfettered by all the research i felt unfettered by having to be like ah oh, and then a white dead male said this and a white dead male said that i could be like no i say this i say this and i'm 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 me and this is what i'm putting forth and i can stand behind it and um I started kind of enjoying that more and more. And I don't know if I'll go back to academic writing. Yeah, it's, two, yeah, it's like two very different kinds. And it's true that that feeling if you write something academic, you constantly feel like you need to prove, like, you know, a proof of validity of what you're saying by quoting someone else. And it's like, am I allowed to have my own opinion? <laughs> like, you know, it, it's like there's a lot of it. Yeah. I think that's ultimately the goal of academe is you do that until you're able to kind of assert yourself without having to back it up um, yeah. by everything everyone else said. And so I think I kind of hit that point and I was just like, no. Nope. Well, I do. I'd like to touch on something interesting you said where it's like about um, evaluating the pitches in terms of like what readership wants to read versus what people want to write about. I'd like to know more about that. I mean, um, how, how do you navigate this? And like, how do you, like, I, I, I know by this point, you must really know what the readership wants, but what are your um, go-to points or like how, like, you know, what makes something stand out for you in terms of like evaluating and, and trying to guess or figure mm -hmm. out what the readers want to want to see? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Becoming editor of the magazine, like the magazine is a very specific media format. And I think the fact that I've written chapters in books and the fact that, are, that I've done academic journals, I have a podcast, like these are all really different forms. Even blogging has a completely different tone and form, uh, the way it's read, the way it's received and the kinds of topics that you can introduce. When it comes to the magazine, right when I became editor is when we moved to the bi-monthly format. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the magazine covers two months and I have to get my files in a month early for the magazine to print means I kind of have a big blind spot. So for example, now today we are recording this, I don't know when you're planning on, uh, on releasing it, but today it's March 16th. I'm wrapping up the May-June issue. It's not even April. So if something comes out uh, beginning of April that's announced now, too late. The magazine's done. So I think any periodical that has a print schedule like that is going to have what I call blind spots. Um, 
where we can't really cover something in there because by the time the magazine comes out, it's too old. You have to kind of look in your crystal ball and see like what's going to be happening in the spring, what's going to be happening in the summer, and then doubly so when it comes to our fall double issue. And then the other mandate that I have with the magazine is I always try to offer variety. Each of the magazines has like four feature, uh, forward facing feature segments. And that includes like the cover story, like just the big features in the front that have a whole lot of pictures and stuff mm -hmm. before we get into the sections where there's like, you know, the columns, the reviews, the stuff that's in every issue. So part of my mandate is to not only keep the coverage timely as per the time I'm talking about, but to offer a big variety. So if the cover story is like, for example, this one, this is the March, April issue, the cover story was hatching. Um, then the secondary story was about the rise of horror poetry. So there's a movie, there's some literature. And then we did uh, The Life and Art of Vern Langdon was an awesome feature we ran uh, by Heather Drain, which is more of a lifestyle piece. So I make sure that each of the features kind of taps a different aspect of Rue Morgue because that's like the hook that we hang our hat on is that we we kind of give you the broad strokes of the genre. It's not just movies, it's also mm -hmm. fashion and books and comic books and music and video games and all that shit. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the mandates. So like sometimes uh, I'll have two film pitches for features that are both really good and it sucks that I have to turn one of them down just because of of pressures like that that sometimes it's really hard for writers to understand or to understand that it's not timely um you know i don't expect people pitching me to know what my print schedule is so i have to explain it and re-explain it a lot but um i understand that it's really difficult to break into horror journalism it's really challenging to pitch especially since a lot of the really established writers they already have ins they already have connections with the distributors like it's like oh uh, felisa rose yeah i could just call her up like mm -hmm. someone fresh out of journalism school doesn't have that and so i realize it's really difficult but um if anyone watching this is like ooh, like i'm taking notes because i want to one day write for andrea it's like start a blog start a twitter learn to cultivate your own voice and mm -hmm. uh and after doing that, you can kind of listen to your own voice and be like, well, what is it that I have to say? And then mm -hmm. um, and then that'll kind of guide uh, where it is you want to go. Nice. Honestly, that's really solid advice. When I was trying to be more of a horror writer, I was like, I don't know what to do. And then I was like, well, Rue Morgue's in town. I'll just, maybe they need an intern. <laughs> so like I'm in my triple threat school and then in between classes I would just go to the room org manor and just like help with filing paperwork and just get advice from people who work there and that was how I got my into like that whole world but you didn't stay I know I didn't stay ah nobody can be an intern forever it's true that was the main thing is like I graduated college and then was like okay I can't be an intern forever I have to do more of my life yeah but you weren't interning to be clear to everyone you weren't interning when I was uh in the picture i was interning under dave alexander mm -hmm. i was the one who like when you got they first moved into the room work manor and i went into the basement and organized the entire magazine stock room and like put everything in order and rodrigo was like oh my god and we're not paying you what what is happening here <laughs> <laughs> nice and i'm like it's fine it's fine i just want to be here i just want to learn from people so just like give me advice you weren't the intern who apparently they told an intern to um, to clean out the fridge and just kind of throw out any grossness in the fridge. And they cleaned out like they threw out everything. They threw out the ketchup. They threw out all the like hot sauces and everything. It's like the legendary yeah. intern, but nobody can remember their name. No, no, that that was definitely not me. I was the one who went, I helped set up the Festival of Fear in one of the last years they did it. I was so hungover that I like. Mid setting it up, I was like, nope, gotta go, and then booked it and just threw up all over the bathroom. Oh, <laughs> like, wow. I, I was the shit show one. Amazing. Nice. Uh, so around the same time that you started the Faculty of Horror podcast, you were also doing the Black Museum. Uh, I knew it when it was at the Royal. I don't know if that's where you started doing. Was it always at the Royal? Or no. Was Do you remember the projection booth East? I know of it, yes. I went there once because um, Blood in the Snow, the oh, first yeah. ever edition was there. Yeah. Because um, I had sent one of my short to Kelly and he 
he was to to program it as part of his i think it was like monthly series if i'm not mistaken before blood in the snow was officially a festival uh -huh. and then at some point he's like oh i'm holding on to it i'm starting a festival are you okay with me playing it i was like yeah sure so took the train to toronto and then i went there it's like it's so fucking far i don't know i know it's probably maybe not far but it was so far from where i was i was more near like union station you know yeah yeah but i remember it was just like in in a part of town where i was like i have no idea i've never been in this area in all my life but yeah yeah it was definitely off the beaten path like yeah. i think toronto east toronto is lovely but yeah. it's kind of its own city so yeah. to speak. So, so most of the action I'd say is in the West End, most of the rep cinemas for sure in the West yeah. End, oh, but the sure. projection booth East was this little independent cinema in the East End. And it was run by a couple at the time. And it was little, like uh, maybe 200 seats, 150, something, something like that. And, and, and these guys were totally, um, accepting of, uh, new ideas and emergent ideas and we can do anything so like yeah uh black museum sure blood in the snow sure kelly was also doing like uh fangoria monthly screenings out of there um i had a birthday party there once and we played guitar hero on the big screen nice. like it was just really <laughs> low-key chummy the guys the people who ran it were like super just yeah let's enjoy it let's have some fun so that's where we started the Black Museum out of. And uh, I remember Paul and I came up with the, well, no, initially we had talked about it with uh, with Stuart Feedback Andrews. He was the original host of the Room Work podcast. Yep. And I hadn't met Paul Korup yet, but uh, the three of us had a meeting to talk about, you know, this project that at the time, I think we were calling it the Miskatonic Toronto because okay. the Miskatonic Institute of Horror Studies in Montreal, Paul was really close with uh, with Kayla Janice, and so was Feedback. And so we're like, yeah, it'll be like a sister chapter. And we wound up kind of going out on our own um, just to break with their format. But um, but yeah, from there, we reached out to the projection booth and they were down and we started doing it out of there. And we built that from like nothing. Like when you don't have a name to go on, it's really intimidating to reach out to people like Vincenzo Natali, like, hey, do you want to come do a lecture? And depending on how much we earn at the door, we can probably pay you something. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. And he was like, sure. And we were like, oh, OK. So he was our first ever speaker for the Black Museum. And he put together a lecture on uh, architecture and horror. And it was so fucking rad. I remember he had storyboards and like previously never seen artwork, uh, concept art from Cube that he showed everyone. And it had a really small stage. And because he was doing a slideshow, it was very dark. And he was talking about the slides and talking about the slides and blah, blah, blah. And he stepped off the edge of the stage and my heart stopped. And I was like, Vincenzo Natale died at age 50. <laughs> her black museum lecture like i could just hear the obit in my head but he like landed on his feet like a cat jumped right back on stage and he kept on going wow what a guy. such a trooper i uh, love that guy he's the fucking best oh truly and you've kept that going up until the pandemic because i guess when theater shut down and you weren't able to take that to an online virtual setting or you just chose to kind of pause it for a bit we had a couple of different formats. I remember when we started it out of the projection booth, we were doing like semesters, you know, <laughs> like we, we thought of it as super academic. So there'll be a semester and a semester will be f a series of five classes every other week on a Thursday evening. And that got old real quick. Paul and I were like, we're exhausted. Every other week mm -hmm. is too often. We're like, you know, our, our, clientele is exhausted it's not good so then we moved to the royal and we started doing a monthly series but then that wasn't going well either because we found we were like if we couldn't find a lecturer uh that we were into we were just kind of plugging people in and it wasn't i don't know it wasn't feeling quite as curated mm -hmm. um so then after that we were like okay look whenever we've got a good event we'll come to you and we'll put on a show and that's how it was uh, at the Royal toward the end. I think our best Black Museum events were, were, were either of you at the uh, Nightmare Tournament? No, I wasn't. No, I was so bummed that I missed that one. So uh, for, for our listeners out there, um, if you've ever heard of the game Nightmare, the famous VHS board game, yes. um, 
we got the grand idea to, um, we found a venue that allowed us to project the video onto a wall. And then we had like 10 different boards and games going on at the same time. (laughs) And it was utter chaos to get it set up because people had to buy seats. And once they bought a seat, we would seat them at a table. And of course you could only have X number of people per table. But I want to play with my friend who registered the other day and there are three of them and there's four of us. And so how do we, oh my God, the night of, like, I don't think I've ever been so stressed putting on an event in my entire life. But as soon as the movie went on and everybody started playing, it was so much fucking fun. And I was instantly so mad that like, why didn't we call the Guinness Book of World Records? Because surely nobody has done this before. Like, why didn't I call Toronto? Yeah. Why didn't I right. I know that? Oh, yeah. it's because I'm so used to these shitty little backyard events where 10 people come and I'm like, yay, I have friends. But that one was a banger. And then uh, I think we, we did it again at Storm Crow years later, but it wasn't the same. Oh, but Storm Crow is like truly oh, the Storm Crow fucking rules. They just don't have like a big enough space to have everybody in one space. And it just wasn't the same. And then another cool thing we did with uh, with Black Meat. I know you guys want to move on, but this was a, a fun no, I'll this forever. I love Black no. Meat. <laughs> we did. Uh, we started doing the Black Museum Debate Club. Nice. Yes, I went to the final girls one oh, and that, that was, was so yeah hairy. that one was a shit show but uh-huh. i loved, i was there for the whole thing i was like i want more i want you all to drink way more and just be drunk on stage <laughs> never again okay well no i shouldn't say never again the first one we did was best stephen king adaptation mm-hmm. and i remember when paul and i came up with that i was like well, we're going to have to take The Shining out because everyone's going to pick The Shining. And how is anyone going to possibly win against The Shining? Nobody fucking picked The Shining. (gasps) Nobody picked it. What were the top picks? Uh, Well, there were four teams of two people each. And I believe it was Maximum Overdrive. A classic. Mm Carrie. From De Palma. Uh, uh, Shit. Pet Cemetery. Yes. Okay. And misery. Huh. Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah. Solid picks, but I thought for sure someone was going to pick The Shining. And wouldn't you believe Maximum Overdrive won? Now, it's because they played the game. You know what I mean? Like, it was a debate. Mm-hmm. And so there were rules. Like, for your rebuttal, you had to dismantle other people's arguments and not just restate yours. And, you know, so, like, it was it was technicalities like that that gave them the edge. But, uh, but they mm-hmm. won it. It was great. And then the second Black Museum debate club was the best sequel. And mm-hmm. that one was Aliens, Evil Dead 2, uh, oh, Dawn of the Dead. And okay. Oh, Exorcist three and Exorcist three one. I was gonna say Exorcist three is yeah. like yeah. Would have been my number one pick. Yeah, I think that was actually the best debate because everybody was super passionate and like it just Exorcist three won by a hair over Dawn mm-hmm. of the Dead. I think. But then, yeah, the final girls won. Like some of our original debaters couldn't come back, and so we had to kind of. Um, get some new people in and yeah, they got wasted. They got emotional. And then the next day they fucking rolled me on Facebook. And I was like, we're not going to name names, but like, we know who did that. It was, it was rough, but being an audience member, I was just like, yes, like I need more. I I, I was having fun even at the time. And I, I remember saying to those girls, like, I'd love to have you back next year. And they were like, if we're asked back, and I'm like, I literally just asked you to come yeah, back. That's literally yeah. who I am. Like, I, I, I did this. <laughs> anyway. Oh my god! So anyway. who won for the final girls? Allie, I don't do you remember. I know it wasn't Gail Weathers. No. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Jay Clark's team, and they were defending? Um, Sally, maybe? I think there was Sally in the mix. I think there was a Lori. I think there was a Gail Weathers. And then there was another kind of oddball. Yeah, there was another. Oh, Tom Thomason from The Witch. Yes, that was it. Oh, Thomason oh yeah. From the Witch. That was an interesting pick. That was an interesting yeah. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And huh. I think you're right. I think Sally won it. 
Yeah, I mm-hmm. feel like that was the case because, like, I think that was Jay and Tal's yeah. team, and like, mm-hmm. oh, bless their hearts for like tolerating that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's some girls crying over there, but we maintain that Sally Hardesty is the best final girl. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was. Uh, it was awesome. I have a lot of really fond memories about that, but like, I just after a while, I just didn't have time. And so, you know, um, Paul and I had a couple of, we had a team of volunteers and we were like, look, if you want it, we'll show you everything there is to do. Like, we'll continue to advise you. And if anything, now that I'm editor of Room Org, I have more contacts than I ever did before. I'll help you out. Um, so we handed it over to Gina Freetag. Oh, Gina's amazing. Shout out to Gina. Gina. It's fucking amazing. I, I also comes from a really academic background. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she was even from Ottawa, like I was, and came over to... Uh, Toronto and was looking to get her feet wet in the horror scene and you know she did an amazing job but then the pandemic hit we did a couple of online things but it just wasn't the same it's so much work to put together something like that and if you're not gonna at least have the pleasure of enjoying it with beer and popcorn and an evening out on college street with friends it just doesn't justify the work you know so uh so we're on hiatus like everything is really uncertain with the city now eh? like i don't even think the royal i don't know if they're doing stuff anymore it's all different yeah i truly don't know anything that's happened all my stuff is now at the review so i Uh, okay my life at that theater now Uh uh because it's great my friend's a programmer there my like best friend has the nightmare alley film series and like they just showed ravenous and i'm obsessed um, I fucking love that movie. I it's love so it so much. They're showing Anguish next month, and I'm like, yay! <laughs> all of this. Um, so 2010, you're defending your thesis, and then you go right into in 2012, 2013, doing the Black Museum, doing Faculty of Horror. 2014, you start working at Room War. 2017 is when you become editor. Are you looking at my LinkedIn? What the fuck? I don't even no, know. This I weirdly really memorized all of these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna bring this up because your timeline is so epic i know it's amazing <laughs> 2010 drop it on the scene and then seven years later you're like sup i'm editor of room war right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean i definitely i'd love to know more about that like transition because i mean these are all those fun projects but then like how do you transition it into making it your own like your career like i mean i'm just kind of curious like is it a serendipitous series of event or no yeah. No, it was, it was hardship and failure and thinking I was fucking up. And yeah, like, I mean, when you put it that way, it sounds amazing. But when I think back on those times, all I can think of was like struggle and struggle and doubting myself and being poor and struggle and struggle. Like, so, um, yeah, I moved to Toronto and I I was working in market research where sociologists go to die. And, uh, but it was a, it was a cushy, well-paying corporate gig. And I was able to do faculty of horror and black museum on the side and no big deal. And I was playing roller derby as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Which was, it, it was really cool. But as soon as I got drafted to the team of my dreams, I hit my head and I got a concussion oh. and I was so desperate to get back to sport that I returned a little bit too early and I got a second concussion. So I had two concussions within six months and they call that a serial concussion. And, uh, it was a bad time. It was, it took a long time to recover. I remember I was on short-term disability from the corporate job and the insurance people would just harass me. Like they just call you every day to be like, when are you getting back to work? When are you getting back to work? What did the doctor say? What And I'm like, I don't remember. I have a brain injury. Like it's not like I have a broken leg and I can limp in when my cast allows. And anyway, I wound up losing that job. I wound up quitting roller derby. Uh, I broke up with my boyfriend at the time. Like it was, it was a rough time where I was just like, fuck, can I even make it in the big city? Is it realistic to have aspirations to keep working in horror? Like, because I knew, or at I was pretty sure that at the time the Black Museum and Faculty of Horror were never going to, you know, be uh, salary paying gigs with benefits. Uh, So I was bartending and uh, questioning my existence when um, an opportunity came up at Room Org to be the office manager. And, you know, it's that gig where you're like, "Ah, I don't really want to answer phones and lick envelopes, but... (laughs) If I get to spend time in the room org manor, like there is no better environment. I'll get to go to all the events. I'll get to do the conventions and stuff like that. And also, you know, 
no shade on the previous office manager, but I was like, I am pretty organized and I think I could actually be pretty good at this job. I think I could do it well. And uh, I think I did do it well. I think I did it pretty well for about five years. Um, yeah. And then, um, and then my editorship, I'm almost interested to hear what that looked like from your point of view before I kind of give the skinny. I didn't really know much of it because like I interned under Dave Alexander and like that was fine. There wasn't like a weird vibe or anything. And then out of the blue, it's like all of a sudden editors just change hands and it felt like it was almost like there was no warning and... I felt like it was also like kind of an awkward situation because of just where Dave Alexander lives slash lives. <laughs> <laughs> and like, didn't know what's happening. All of a sudden I hear that he had moved out of Ontario or something. So there was a lot of, yeah, like a lot of gossip just around what had happened. And it was like, well, I mean, a lady's in charge now. So <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with this, like has my vote. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, it's interesting because Rue Morgue is one of the first magazines that I remember subscribing to. And that was back when Jovanka was editor-in-chief. Yeah, so so like for a really long time, I was like, oh, Rue Morgue to me was always like the super cool top magazine because it's like, hey, it's a woman in charge. It's really cool. And like that to me was like, okay, I feel like this like in terms of like mm -hmm. horror publication like there's some representation of myself in there like you know and and then like at some point yeah it switched to Dave Alexander who I've never really met so I don't have really have any opinion but I was like oh okay another dude and then at some point I heard that you were like you know the one in charge I was like oh cool it's back to like you know being run by a woman like you know I'm gonna pick it up again and like check it out and and yeah so that that's when my, you started uh, is when it went to bi-monthly correct well, yeah, that's just it. So, so basically, you know, Rodrigo kind of dropped a bomb on all of us to say, hey, listen, you know, the industry is what it is. We're doing what we can, but we're going to have to drop down to bi-monthly. Um, folks are going to have to move down to part-time and ostensibly work from home. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to step in as editor. And we were all like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds this good, <laughs> is happening. And at the time, I was a full-time employee, and I was working here at the Rue Morgue Manor, which, uh, if you don't know, is Rue Morgue's headquarters in Toronto. And it is a office area, but we also have, like, uh, a big lounge in the back with a whole bunch of horror collectibles. The lounge is, like, my favorite place. I helped move a bunch of that stuff in. And, like, it's... So the giant Clive Barker painting on the wall is, like, pristine. Nice. It's pretty special. Like there's a pool table, there's a projector. It's like, I don't know. I don't want to say that it's like a museum or anything. It's really difficult to describe. It's, it's very much an office, but it's also a pretty cool looking office. And so I understand when people are in town and they want to come visit. Anyway, as office manager, I was like, well, like, is my job secure? Like, you know, whatever you do editorially, you're still going to need someone to answer the phones and lick envelopes. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, what's going to... Um, what's going to happen with the office? Like, are we going to get to keep this big space? And they're like, well, I guess someone's going to have to move in there. And I was like, what the fuck? And I remember this was right around the time that Mike Gingold had resigned as editor of Fangoria. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This was kind of like the death twitches of the old Fango when like all of a sudden they were changing hands of editors really quick and it was like, oh, some bad shit's going on. And I think they stopped publishing altogether. Down during that time. I'm yeah. sorry? No, go Ali. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, no, I know all about that. A lot of shit went down during. Oh, yeah, I guess you would. You yeah. remember that mode? Yeah, I was going to say, didn't they also stop publishing altogether, Fango, at some point around that it time? That's when they went purely digital and then it came back, I think. And right? then it came yeah, back yeah. under Cinescope and that back. was a whole was different thing. Yeah. But at the time, you know, like Mike Gingold was out there. And so I was positive that Mike Gingold would be the next editor of Rumor. Yeah. And so, you know, like we we had those news, that news and we had some uh, period of several months to kind of digest it. And I went on as 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 I do. And then uh, Rodrigo came into town and he sat me down and he said, uh, I wonder 
if you have any like ideas for the magazine since it's changing hands. And I was like, well, as a matter of fact, like I had a notebook, I had a whole bunch of ideas. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember what they were. I, I, I had envisioned the versus page of the magazine, do you know, versus? Yeah, that was gonna be my thing was you guys, you brought in that versus page where it's like this versus this. Yeah. At the back, Ooh, we always have yeah. like debate. And this was inspired yeah. by the Black Museum where it's like we would yeah. ask one of horror's most burning questions and give two writers uh, a chance to battle it out. Um, and I had other ideas for stuff and I presented them to him and he said, uh, I would like you to be the editor of Room Org. And I was gobsmacked. I like spat out my cocktail and um, yeah, I did not see that coming at all. But the way he put it to me, he's like, you know, you've been doing Black Museum, you've been doing the Faculty of Horror, you've shown that you're creative and you have original ideas and your star is rising and I think you'd be great. And I was like, I don't know the first thing about putting together a magazine, you know, but he was willing to work very closely with me and we still work very closely together. And uh, yeah, that's how that happened. But I know I, it was definitely difficult at first because to a lot of people, I came out of nowhere. Like I wasn't like Mike Gingold. I wasn't like people in Toronto kind of knew who I was, but mm -hmm. not really. Um, I was kind of new. Um, but I did have something of a body of work behind me, thanks to Faculty of Horror and the chapters I had written. And uh, yeah, that was that. It was a lot. Going <laughs> and, I, and then I moved into the Rue Morgue Manor. So, so now the office area is downstairs, but I live with my partner and my dog um, in the same building above it. Which is so cool. It's really like the coolest place to live. <laughs> But going forward, what are you hoping to like do with the magazine or with the podcast now that we're coming close to like an hour of recording? Like, what are you are hoping? We? I know, wow. right? 57 we minutes. We can keep going. Easy. We can keep going. Like, whatevs. Um, but yeah, going forward, what are you hoping to do, hoping to accomplish? Is there a new medium you want to tackle? Like, do you want to get into making a film or writing scripts? Do you know, I. I know that that is a trajectory of some horror journalists. Uh, I know that was the case for Mick Garris. I know that was the case for Joe Dante. It was the case for Yovanka. Um, it was the case for Rodrigo. But I don't, like, my brain, I'm deeply creative, but my brain doesn't creatively write. Uh, I love to look at scripts and give them a gloss. I really like uh, spiffing up people's dialogue, but I can't come up with a story to save my life. Um, but I'm really enjoying streaming. I've started streaming on Twitch. I guess I started in uh, uh, August. Yeah, I and I've, thank you, thank you. I stream uh, just chatting streams about horror and whatever, what have you, on uh, Sunday afternoons. That's my Sunday Sabbath show. And then Terror Tuesdays, I play usually an indie horror video game. And it's really fun. And it's really chill. And that's been... That's been a really interesting medium for me because, as I mentioned before, the podcast is very edited and clipped and curated, and I'm speaking about complex subjects at a high level, and da 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 da. And then Remorg, you know, is written and edited and proofed and edited again, mm -hmm. uh, and everything is very controlled. So I think, you know, I was struggling a little bit with uh, Faculty of Horror live shows. Being live on stage was. Um, was kind of terrifying because I didn't have that control that I had over the magazine and over the podcast. I couldn't edit and clip and cut and paste and, oh wait, that sounded weird. Like I, I needed to be able to think on my feet a bit better. And so I started streaming to kind of uh, flex that muscle. And uh, when I get bored of streaming, I don't know what else there is to do, guys. Yeah, we're also figuring that out. Was this a thing you kind of discovered during the pandemic when you were just home all the time? I feel like the pandemic had something to do with it, for sure, being home, um, because it's it. Twitch really has its own language and it has its own community and it has its own everything. And it's actually really intimidating to start um, mm -hmm. because you don't really know what's going on. You're not sure exactly how to interact with everybody. You're not sure what's, uh, what's a faux pas and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I think it actually really came out when we did a Faculty of Horror episode on CAM. And uh, after watching Cam and talking about, I love that film. I also read Issa Meze's book, Cam Girl. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is a whole world that I don't know about. So I think those were the things that kind of uh, pushed me into that direction. Heck yes. That's I love amazing. it. I love hearing more people getting into like Twitch streaming instead of going into like the road that kind of everyone, you know, tends to go into with like filmmaking and everything. It's nice to see them going mm -hmm. into a different direction. 
Yeah, well, like a lot of horror creatives are content creators. And I think that wasn't a term 15 years ago. I think even five years ago, it was kind of a four letter word. Like no one knew what it was like, what an influencer? What is that? That's like, like, like an Instagram girl. Like, but now people make a living on having informed opinions and being able to share it across a variety of media in an articulate way that builds a community. That's a thing now. And it's not shady. It's not sketchy. It's not sexist it's fucking cool yeah and it's really cool because it just like generates it helps build this whole ecosystem around it you know because i remember in the early 2000s i would go to conventions and being a horror fan like obviously i went to festival of fear at fan expo and and all of these but it always felt like um the anime people they had a whole world you know of like it wasn't just a movie it was like all of these derived things and it kind of felt for horror it was just like Horror merch from movies. Oh, and here's book and DVD stands. And that, like, there's like no like lifestyle that much, you know? Or it's like, you know, if you like, you know, if you wanted something that was more lifestyle or even like home decor, like, you know, okay, good, go to Spirit Halloween, you know? But yeah, it's not gonna feel like there's more there's more of a, of like an ecosystem of like also just, yeah, that's it, like other type of like internet content that's not just movie reviews or new filmmakers like you know just something like horror related so that's you know really good that's really cool (laughs) i think the rise of content creating has helped a lot of small business people really flourish and find their niche and start doing like really creative and unique things with horror like i follow one person who spends their time making like acrylic fake nails that are all horror themed and i'm like yes that's amazing like i love that our little horror community is becoming like businesses for people and they're able to like pay their bills with it that's how it should be. Yeah. It's a good time to be a horror fan. Uh, you hear a lot of small business complain that the market is saturated, that Instagram and the algorithms are burying my this and that. But the fact of the matter is I I truly believe that if you're persistent, your audience will find you. You just have to you just have to hang in there and catch that break. That's what happened with Faculty of Horror and uh, it could happen to you. Cool. Heck yeah. So one thing I'm dying to ask, and we're going to go backwards a bit, we <laughs> talked about all of your accomplishments and everything, but what got you into horror? Like, you know, what really got you interested in that? Have you been a fan since a kid? Like, yeah, I want to know more about, you know, how you got into the genre. Yeah. Um, I got into that. I was an early reader. Um, I remember my mom, uh, she was reading me Anne of Green Gables at bedtime, and then she started just handing me the book, and then I would read to her at bedtime, and then I would read by myself at bedtime, and then I was reading all the time. And uh, this might be a really fucking Southern Ontario thing, but you guys remember the bookmobile? <gasps> yeah, the bookmobile! <laughs> <laughs> so the public library would have this big, like, truck, like this portable library called the bookmobile. Ours was like every- an old school bus. I think ours was too. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I remember it opening and the steps mm-hmm. coming out like an old school bus, but like my memory of the interior is really hazy. Anyway, the bookmobile would come and park at our school parking lot every other week mm-hmm. and they would have some YA stuff that was a mm-hmm. little bit spicy. And that's where I got into like Christopher Pike, R.L. Stein, and from there onto Stephen uh, King. Really I remember I wanted to stay, take Stephen King books out at the bookmobile and they were like, you're too young. I'm sorry, we're not allowed. And I had to get my mom to write a note and she did, God bless her. Because she read them too. And uh, <laughs> and then after that, it was wanting to see all the movies based on these books. So I wanted to watch Pet Cemetery. I wanted to watch The Shining. I wanted to watch Misery and Carrie and, and all that shit. But, you know, my friends weren't into it. Even in high school, my friends weren't into it. And horror was always a solo sport. And it wasn't until I was in university that I started meeting and mixing with other horror fans. And that's when they introduced me to the stuff that I had missed. The great stuff, like Evil Dead. Like, you don't know about Evil Dead unless you see someone with a t-shirt and you're like, what the fuck? Like, this is before the internet. Not to talk numbers here, but, you know, I'm 40. I came up in the in the Fangoria Rue Morgue era, where that's where you found out about the cool shit. So you had to work a little bit harder to discover it. Ugh, I'm really bummed about the bookmobile. I wish we still had one. Just like I still wish we had Scholastic's book fairs, but for adults. They don't do that anymore? I have no idea, but they definitely don't have those cool 
like little booklets you would take home and like circle all the things you wanted so you knew how yeah. much money to bring to school the next day to be like this is what I'm buying so that's I what home. I wanted to ask you know because I mean in Quebec we used to have the little pamphlet you know in our English class it would give us this scholastic thing so that if we wanted to order books we could but we never had a book fair per se and I keep always hearing people say like the scholastics book fair I'm like oh my god you mean there's an event where oh, you could get to see the bad. books I mean, books. all I got was like the like you know form, and then like you know I would spend way too much every month. But my mom she's like, well, she's reading. I can't complain, you know. So. Yeah, that was I remember was... that though mode. Yeah. yeah, I remember submitting a form, and it would come to you in a plastic bag, and you mm -hmm. would be like, yay! It, it was later in my high school that there would be a fair. Where, okay, that's good. Yeah, okay. you would still have a catalog, but you could also browse. Yeah, we had yeah. the catalog, and we could browse, but that was like my elementary school we did that and then right up until like I got to college I was like all for any of the book fairs because you could get your books you can get like a weird poster of like a car or a cat and then you get <laughs> holographic bookmarks yeah I, had, I remember I got a pen that had like 10 different colors that like you know those big fat pens yeah. and you try to push them all down at once of course you do oh, yeah. yeah rainbow pen right logic rainbow pen. <laughs> yes <laughs> Cool. Um, well, since we're getting close to the hour mark, I would suggest maybe we could do the lightning round. And, uh, What's yeah. that? Yeah. Are you ready for it? Do a bunch of really quick, easy questions and get your, like, off-the-cuff answer. Okay. Yes. Right. Everyone definitely loves, and it's yeah. not awkward at all. I'm, like, totally not inspired by the Colbert questionnaire, although he's got way much more random esoteric questions. Like, you know, we're still we're still figuring it out. I think every episode I, I slip a new one in, you know, eventually we're going to have to find out, like, what the best ones are. Yeah. But, there yeah. Do you want to okay. start or do I start? Yeah. Um, number one, fave horror film. Oh, man. You guys. See? I think we have to stop leading with that one. The Shining. Yeah. Of course you do. You got to give like a top three. You got to, you know, yeah. lube me up a little bit. <laughs> uh, favorite subgenre? Uh, Sci-fi horror? Oh, cool. Uh, cool. Uh, favorite horror franchise? Ooh, Hellraiser. Really? Not Amityville? <laughs> <laughs> <In space. laughs> Uh, zombies or vampires? Oh, vampires. Ghosts or slashers? Slashers. You know, just, I don't think anyone has ever said zombie at the previous question. Everybody so no, far has been vampires. Like, you know. slashers, like, that's what we want. Uh, well, it's like, who would you rather be? Who would you rather fuck? Who would you rather have dinner with? Like, yeah. it's vampires in so many respects. Oh, I just had an idea for a new question. Yeah, okay. I was also thinking the same thing. <laughs> what vampire yeah. I'd fuck? Lestat. Uh, Lestat. Yeah. Wait, which version of Lestat? Queen of the Damned. Oh, okay. That's what I was going to say, too, because I was like, eh, I could leave her take. I'm going to take her like Tom Cruise. <laughs> um, most underrated horror film? Ooh. Mm, Serbian film? Oh. I'm an apologist. I uh, Come at me, bro. Cool. Uh, do you have uh, who's your horror crush? Could be Ooh. man, woman, real, f fictional, alive, dead, whatever. Justin Benson. All right. He's All kind right. Of dreamy. Have you guys seen him? Yeah, he's a babe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, favorite snack to eat while watching horror films? Popcorn. Ah, uh, it's a classic. Yes. Um, if you could remake any film or adapt a book, what would it be and why? Flowers in the Attic, <gasps> because no one has done it right! Right? I'm, right. like, still mad about the latest one. That was a couple years back, I guess. They're just um, getting worse and worse. It's uh, it's such a good story. I don't understand. You want to constantly go very, like, CW with it, so it hits a mainstream <sighs> younger audience, and it's like, no, just use the source material. Yeah. yeah. Uh, What's your dream project? Ooh, uh, remaking Flowers in the Attic. Um, uh, maybe a book tour? <gasps> nice. I love it. Love it, love it, love okay. it. Write a book or this would be a book you've already written? No, I'd have to write a book. I, <laughs> the book I wrote. <laughs> I ain't touring for that shit. Okay, well, that's a new one I'm adding to our lightning questionnaire. Uh, fuck, Mary kill. The horror yeah, edition. We have to give three things. Yeah. yeah. 
Off the top of my head, I have none. Uh, Freddie, Michael Myers, Jason. Um, Fuck Michael, marry Freddie, kill Jason. Yeah, I think I'm with you. Like, I definitely marry Freddie because I think he's got good chat. Yeah, um, I think he's just or fun. Kill, I mean, I'm trying to think who's in better shape. I'm going to keep the mask on. I just like every time that like Jason takes off the mask, I'm like, eh, I'm good. Yeah. Jason looks like he smells terrible. And I don't yeah. feel that yeah. way about Michael. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. I feel like because Michael has been in institutions and prison like situations, like yeah. I know I'm forced to shower. <laughs> yeah. And it I only just goes down. That one and nothing else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a good one for lightning round, though, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to go with. Put in there. Uh, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Christian Bale. Oh, oh no, yeah, uh, Antonio Banderas, because they uh -huh. were the three vampires. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. I don't cool. know. Who, yeah. Yeah, which one? Which one's which? <laughs> I feel like it would have to be like. Fuck Antonio Banderas. Fuck like, Antonio. Yeah. Mary, Brad. Mary Lestat. <laughs> kill Brad. He was whiny in that movie. You're all kind of whiny. I don't like Tom Cruise, but I think I like Brad Pitt less. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Bold. I love it. Yeah. Uh, where can our viewers find you at, or where do you want to be found? Where can you not find me at? I guess the trickiest part is spelling my last name. But uh, we've included links to Room Org Magazine, which, uh, as I said, yeah. I'm working on the May-June issue. Do -do 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 -do. Okay. Um, we're also nominated for a number of rondos, as these girls mentioned. So if you go to root-morg.com and you search rondos, I've made a handy-dandy cut-and-paste ballot. Um, if you'd like to do it that way, it's a little bit easier. And then there is the Faculty of Horror podcast. Beep. Uh, which can be found there, but also on Spotify and wherever fine podcasts are found. We put out episodes on the main feed once a month, uh, but we also have a Patreon, which has a whole bunch of bonus content, including a new show that we just started called It's Only a Movie, where I will make Alex watch something that she's never seen before and tell us about it, or vice versa. It's really fun. Um, and then uh, I think I mentioned Twitch. Boink. Uh, yeah, Tuesday nights and Sunday afternoons. Would love to see you in there. Nice. Amazing. And nice. to finish, so do you have anyone that you, I guess, uh, that you'd love to either work with or meet in life? Like, you know, one of the biggest highlights of my career was talking to Clive Barker on the phone. We had such a lovely chat. He ranted about Donald Trump. Uh, his oh, parakeet, nice. he has this like macaw that was just like, ah, in the background the whole time. I would really love to meet him and his parrot. It's on my bucket mm. list. Amazing. Love it. Love it. Cool. Love well, um, this, I guess this brings us to an end of another Let's Scream episode. So thank you so much for joining us this week. It was Thanks wonderful having, me, ladies. having with you. Pleasure to chat with you. And yeah, as usual, everybody, uh, we invite you to check out um, our Patreon because we are part of the Infamous Horror Network. And also we are on Twitter and you can chat with us there. Let us know what you think, what you like, what you'd like us to talk about, who you'd like us to talk about. Um, let us know your thoughts. You know, we're there. We're there for mm -hmm. you to um, answer your comments and your burning questions. And yeah, let us know what you'd like to see. Heck yes, Thank until you. next time. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>